Hello, my name is Stephen Jenkins, and I have two boys with cystinosis. When my older son was first diagnosed, I wanted to learn everything I could about the disease. While I'm not an expert or specialist, I believe that we all need to learn everything we can about cystinosis to be better advocates for our children and ourselves. This talk is especially for families of newly diagnosed children, but I hope that everyone can learn something from it. I've given a version of this talk for several years of the Day of Hope, so sorry if some of it is familiar. These are my boys, Samuel and Lars. Both of them have cystinosis. Sam, on the right, was diagnosed when he was 12 months old. Lars, on the left, was diagnosed shortly after birth. Even though they are three years apart, a lot of people think they are twins. Now, to understand cystinosis, you have to know a little cellular biology. The human body is made up of about 40 trillion cells. Each cell is made up of different compartments. There are organelles called ribosomes, mitochondria, lysosomes, and even something called the Golgi apparatus. The most important compartment is the nucleus. The nucleus is the command center of the cell. The nucleus contains the genetic blueprint for the cell, and it's the same blueprint for every cell in the body. This blueprint is called DNA. The DNA is wound up really tightly into structures called chromosomes, which is the big blue X-shaped thing. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes, half are from your mom and half from your dad. The 23rd chromosome is either an X or a Y, which determines your biological sex. What is DNA exactly? Think about DNA as instructions for building proteins. A segment of DNA that codes for one protein is called a gene. Proteins are made up of building blocks called amino acids. The cell has a special builder called a ribosome that can read the gene transcripts, called RNA, and build a protein. Once a protein is built, it goes off into the cell to perform its special function. Some proteins catalyze metabolic reactions, some proteins are important structural components of cells, and some proteins are transporter proteins and move things in and out of cells or in and out of compartments within the cell. The way we like to explain this to our children is with Legos. The instructions for building the Lego set are the DNA. The master builder that puts the Lego set together is the ribosome. And the individual building blocks that you need to build the protein are amino acids. The finished product, in this case a fancy race car, is the protein. So what happens if part of the instructions are missing? We call that a mutation. So Emmett, the master builder, comes to build the protein and the part that tells him to add the spoiler is missing. So now we have a mutated race car without a spoiler. This is what happens in genetic diseases like cystinosis. There is a mutation in the gene that codes for a protein called cystinosin. We will talk more about that protein in a sec. Remember how each person has 23 pairs of chromosomes? Well, back in 1998, Dr. Corinne Antoniak in France discovered the location of the cystinosis gene. It's on the 17th chromosome. One of the scientists in Dr. Antoniak's lab who worked on this discovery was Dr. Stephanie Sherkey. Since then, more than 100 mutations of the cystinosin gene have been identified. The most frequent mutation is a large deletion of 57,000 base pairs, which is commonly referred to as the 57KB mutation. It affects anywhere from 50 to 75% of people with cystinosis who are of Northern European descent. Cystinosis is an autosomal recessive disease, which means an individual needs two mutated copies of the cystinosis gene in order to get the disease. If you only have one copy of the mutated gene, you won't have cystinosis, but you will be a carrier. If you have two carriers that get together and have a baby, there are four different scenarios. The child gets a normal copy from mom and a normal copy from dad. That child will be unaffected. The child gets a normal copy from mom and a mutated copy from dad. That child will be unaffected, but will be a carrier. Or the child gets a mutated copy from mom and a normal copy from dad. That child will also be a carrier. The last scenario is the child gets a mutated copy from mom and a mutated copy from dad. That child will have cystinosis. Note that in this cartoon, the mom and the dad have different mutations designated by a different shade of blue. Maybe she has the 57KB mutation and he has a nonsense mutation. 
They don't have to have the same mutation as long as the mutation leads to a loss of function. Here's a picture of the cystinosin protein from the New England Journal of Medicine. This picture shows many of the mutations that have been identified. You'll notice that the protein is located in the membrane of something called a lysosome. So what exactly is a lysosome? You'll remember from earlier that human cells have different compartments in them. One of those compartments is the lysosome. In this graphic, it's the orange blob. Lysosomes are the recycling center of the cell. If there is an old or damaged protein, it gets engulfed by the lysosome, digested into those building blocks called amino acids, which can then be ex exported out of the lysosome to be used to build new proteins. So in this slide, the orange circle is a lysosome. An old protein represented by the Lego race car is brought into the lysosome recycling center. And then Lloyd, the green ninja, does some kung fu on it to break it down into its individual amino acids. Each of these amino acids can then leave the lysosome through their own transporter protein. One of those amino acids is called cysteine. It gets out of the lysosome through a transporter protein called cystinosin. If that protein is mutated or absent, however, then the cysteine can't get out of the lysosome. The cysteine accumulates until it crystallizes, which eventually kills the cell. This is happening in every cell of the body, which is why cystinosis affects every organ in the body. Fortunately, in 1976, a really smart guy named Jerry Schneider at UCSD discovered a drug called cysteamine that reacted with the cysteine in the lysosome to form a different molecule that resembles an amino acid called lysine. Once the cysteamine binds to the lysine, it can escape the lysosome through a different transporter. Dr. Schneider worked with other scientists back at NIH, including Joe Schulman and Bill Gall, to do the first clinical study of cysteamine in humans. The drug was approved as Cystagon in the United States back in 1994. Cystamine was a game changer. While it is not a cure, it does prolong life for people with cystinosis. It also delays time to kidney transplant, and it slows the development of late complications of cystinosis like muscle wasting. It is a challenging medication to take, however, because it must be administered every six hours, and it causes significant side effects including nausea, vomiting, and a strong sulfurous odor. Thanks to research funded by the Cystinosis Research Foundation, we now have a delayed release version of cystamine called procystine. It must be taken every 12 hours, which may improve patient adherence. It has similar side effects as cystagon, but they are usually delayed. Procysby is not available in every country, and cost is a big issue. The first major organ affected by cystinosis is the kidneys. Most children develop something called Fanconi syndrome by about six months, which leads to severe thirst and excessive urination, as well as growth failure. Without treatment, cystinosis leads to end-stage renal disease by about 8 to 10 years old. Even with treatment, many children develop renal failure in their teens. So what exactly is Fanconi syndrome? It's important to point out that Fanconi syndrome is not the same thing as cystinosis. Cystinosis is the most common inherited cause, however. Any child with Fanconi syndrome needs to be evaluated for cystinosis. Fanconi syndrome is characterized by the inability of the kidneys to reabsorb essential molecules from the urine. The kidneys filter blood, and many important things like glucose, phosphorus, potassium, and bicarbonate are reabsorbed in a part of the kidney called the proximal tubule. Loss of the cystinosin protein leads to dysfunction of the proximal tubule, so people lose these essential molecules in their urine. This leads to high volumes of urine as well as malnutrition and electrolyte abnormalities. You treat Fanconi syndrome by replacing all the essential molecules with supplements. So in addition to cystagon or procysby, people with cystinosis have to take dozens of other pills every day including potassium, bicarbonate, phosphorus, and others. Even with treatment of Fanconi syndrome, people still develop end-stage renal disease. Before cystamine, this usually occurred around 8 to 10 years of age. In 1970, a surgeon named Dr. Mahoney performed the first successful kidney transplants in four patients with cystinosis. This was one of the most revolutionary advances in the treatment of cystinosis. It, it significantly improved life expectancy, and there was no recurrence of Fanconi syndrome in the transplanted kidney. But we all know that kidney transplants are not a cure for cystinosis because cystinosis affects every cell and every organ in the body. Even with a kidney transplant, the other complications will develop. 
Another organ affected early on in cystinosis is the eye. Cystine crystals develop in the corneas and are usually visible on slit lamp examination by one year. Crystals cause photophobia, or light sensitivity, and can progress to irritation, pain, and even blindness. The crystals are so characteristic that the disease can be diagnosed by an ophthalmologist even without blood tests. Oral cysteamine cannot get to the corneas because there are no blood vessels in the cornea, so the only way to treat corneal cystinosis is with topical therapy such as eye drops. Eye drops were developed back in the 1980s but were not FDA approved until 2013. Cysteran eye drops work, but they have to be given multiple times a day, and many patients cannot tolerate the preservatives. The above picture shows a 43-month-old before and after treatment with cystamine eye drops. There's also a cystamine eye gel called Cystadrops, available in Europe and Canada. CRF has funded scientists looking for better eye treatments, including Dr. Morgan Fedorchak from Pittsburgh. She has invented a hydrogel that can be loaded with cystamine and administered as a controlled release eye drop, possibly once a day. This is currently being tested in animals. Cystinosis also affects the bones through multiple mechanisms. Fanconi syndrome leads to loss of phosphorus and calcium in the urine, and this leads to rickets or soft bones. This results in a characteristic bowing of the leg bones seen in this picture. This is treated with phosphorus supplementation, as well as vitamin D and sometimes calcium. CRF is funding many scientists who are studying how cystinosis affects the bones. Cystinosis also affects the muscles. Cystine accumulation in the muscle cells leads to muscle wasting and weakness, usually starting in the muscles of the hands and progressing to muscles of swallowing and breathing. Muscle function is improved by strict adherence to cysteamine, but muscle disease is not eliminated. Other possible therapies include vitamin D, carnitine, coenzyme Q10, and vitamin B complex. The CRF is funding multiple scientists who are looking for new therapies to treat muscle disease. In this chart, I've summarized many of the other complications of cystinosis. I hope it's clear by now that since cystinosis is a genetic disease, it affects every cell, tissue, and organ in the body. So if you want to cure a disease like cystinosis, you have to find a way to cure every cell. This is where Dr. Stephanie Sherkey comes in. She was a scientist in Dr. Corinne Antonyak's lab when they discovered the cystinosin gene on the 17th chromosome. Now that they had found the gene, Dr. Sherkey was determined to find a gene therapy for cystinosis. The next thing they did was create the first mouse with cystinosis by silencing the cystinosin gene. This is called a knockout mouse because the gene has been knocked out. Once they had a mouse model for cystinosis, they could study new therapies and try to understand the disease better. Dr. Sherkey wondered whether a hematopoietic stem cell transplant might be a way to cure cystinosis. So she took a healthy mouse with the same genetic background as her cystinosis knockout mouse and took some stem cells from it. Then she transplanted those stem cells into a knockout mouse with cystinosis. Surprisingly, the knockout mouse was cured. This was published in 2009. Now when you take stem cells from one individual and transplant them into another, it's called an allogeneic transplant. Allogeneic transplants are risky. Sometimes the transplanted stem cells attack the patient. This is called graft-versus-host disease. About 20% of patients who get an allogeneic bone marrow transplant die of complications. So Dr. Sherkey wanted to find another way. That other way was an autologous stem cell transplant. Autologous means you get your own stem cells. But before you transplant your own stem cells, you have to fix the mutated genes. So you take a knockout mouse with cystinosis, and you take some of its stem cells. You use a virus to insert copies of the corrected cystinosin gene into the stem cells, and then you give them back to the knockout mouse. Miraculously, this treatment cured the knockout mouse. This work was published back in 2013. The next step was to get FDA approval to try this approach in humans. As everyone knows by now, Jordan Jans was the first human to receive a gene-corrected autologous stem cell transplant on October 7, 2019 in San Diego. Here he is with his mother Barb and Dr. Sherkey. It was a historic day that gave hope to everyone affected by cystinosis. Could this be the cure? There are many more tests to be done to answer that question, but I am excited to hear an update from Dr. Sherkey on how Jordan is doing. I was also excited to hear that a second person has enrolled in the trial and is awaiting their transplant. Well, that's the end of the talk. 
I hope you learned something and that you feel more empowered to teach others about cystinosis. I hope to see you all next year at the Day of Hope.